Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. We're excited to have uh, Steve Barry joining us from Southern California. Uh, Steve's going to walk us through his journey in creating an entrepreneurial operating system. Uh, before we get started, a couple quick uh, housekeeping things. Uh, during the presentation, if you have any issues, um, please put your issue in the chat window and Becky or I will uh, do our best to assist you. If you have any questions that you would like Steve to address uh, either at the end of his presentation or uh, if he's at a spot in his presentation that he can uh, that he can address you in line, um, please use the Q&A function and uh, we'll organize those questions for Steve and he also will be able to see them as you enter them. Uh, the Q&A and the chat functions are located at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, all right, let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Barry to you today. Steve is the founder of the Santa Monica-based design studio Thought Merchants. He's a product designer, a user experience expert, an artist, and an entrepreneur who has worked with brands such as Casper Mattress, Harry's, Chainlink, Code Climate, and Riot Games. Uh, I have known Steve since very early in his journey, and um, yeah, he wasn't quite that small, but he, he was... <laughs> He was much younger. Um, uh, and I can honestly say he's one of the most creative and talented uh, people that I've had the pleasure to work with. Um, very appreciative, very appreciative that he was able to join us today. Um, and uh, all right, let me turn it over to Steve. I think you're really going to enjoy his presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Leo. And uh, thanks everybody for joining. I know we got a small crew here. So if you um, have any questions, definitely ask them. I'll try to answer them in line. But yeah, let's get started. Oh, hold on. Of course. Present fail. I try to scan. There we go. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is the Entrepreneurial Consulting Operating System. It's a big word, but um, <laughs> sorry, big title. But I'm trying to use my journey as a lattice to talk about the emotional and tactical aspects of becoming an entrepreneur, trying to build businesses, and what does that you know, process look like under the hood? We are a uh, you know, unique design stu studio that solves your hardest problem. And Leo mentioned already, um, the different types of offerings that we do, but we mainly serve emerging and high growth companies. I like to say people, process, and products. Uh, you're going to pull us in for products. Like there's an acute need. We need this feature done. We need this, you know, reimagine re the version of the experience or application. Um, but the process uh, informs the product. And I have to go in and start coaching. And I do a lot of agile design and development coaching for companies. But at the end of the day, People are always the problem, and uh, they need coaching, training, support, advocacy, uh, and a healthy work environment to create a better process to then create a better product. And so as a consultant over the years, I like to treat all three of these things. It's been 60 plus clients over 12 years, and you know it's the overnight success that took 10 years. This is the studio. We're like five blocks off the beach in Santa Monica. Before this, I was in New York City. Before that, Philadelphia. Before that, Westchester, PA. Um, these are the polished images. And this is a photo of the studio this morning. And there's Austin Barto, an illustrator and designer here at Thought Merchants working on the right-hand side. And the Sensodyne toothpaste that I need tonight. Well, how did we get here? And by the way, these black slides with the white letters, that's like the insight slides. Well, it's thousands of small decisions aligned in the same direction. I kind of talk about it in being an entrepreneur or even a designer. You need to have a lens that you look through the world with and solve problems. And that's all about aligning, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of small decisions over years. How do I get started? Well, <laughs> um, I hunted at 12, so... But I couldn't drive at 12. I drive at 16 and a half, which is bonkers growing up in the rural part of Pennsylvania. I grew up in Collegeville. I was a science fair nerd. The science fair allowed me to go to prep school, which I'm very thankful my grandparents were able to pay for. Uh, and that gave me a big leg up. And here's some photos of that time. And uh, I had an art teacher in 
high school, Gabriel Rusumano, that really pushed me to become an artist and pushed me to go to art school. And so I had an option to go to either, or I was accepted rather, to go to RISD or to SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design in Georgia. And I decided to go with, to SCAD because they had a bigger focus on technology, uh, digital art, digital design, commercial design. RISD is much more traditional, you know, painting, illustrating, fabrics, textiles, those kind of things. And it was a lot of convincing uh, my family. I was the first person to go to college in my family. So there's a lot of unknown. And uh, something I'll never forget, when I was about ready to go, my grandparents were like, mm, you know, you should really be a, a Comcast cable installer because they have a, you know, a steady wage. You know, we see them everywhere. It's in demand. And uh, it's something that it took, a, you know, it, it really resonated with me and that and it kind of hurt. And I, I kind of set out that point to like prove them wrong. And going to art school had a, a lot of fun. The South is a lot of fun. Uh, I kind of skip over that a little bit, but uh, I graduated. I really buckled down my last, my senior year. And I had to move in back in with my parents because I was broke. I had no money. I had no job. And that was the only location that I could really go. So I went back to Collegeville and a lot of my friends that came from wealthier families, they went right to New York City. They went right to Los Angeles. They went right to Chicago. They're like, well, why can't you come? And I was like, dude, I don't have any money to, to move. Like, I got to find a job first and then have money to then do stuff. And I think it's an interesting, um, you got to keep that in mind because a lot of different people have a lot of different approaches to how they graduate college and get their first job. All right, my first design job. Uh, it was in Westchester, PA. It's, uh, you got to be able to join a company where you have the ability to fail the more risk you can take in the first job, the better, especially if you want to become an entrepreneur. And I always say you want to be in the position where you can bankrupt the company you're working at right now. Uh, you want that much risk and, and influence. And it's a double-edged sword in that, you know, you're flying by the seat of your pants a lot, but you're going to learn so much so quickly. And when I got my first design job, the same grandparents were like, oh, we always knew you were going to make it. You know, I was like, all right. Um, you know, there's definitely an emotional toll in this kind of stuff because there's so much uncertainty. And the fun thing is, I was commuting from Collegeville to Westchester. That's about a 40 minute drive commuting one way. And that was the last time I would ever commute by car ever. Uh, since then, it's been New York City transit, walking, or bike riding, which has been a big goal of mine as a you know, design professional and entrepreneur. Well, 2008 rolls around and the economic downturn arrives and a bunch of people got laid off at the company I was working at. I eventually got laid off. Uh, I always say it's the worst, best thing to happen to me because I had no idea what I was going to do next, where to go. At this point, I was running a, sharing an a, a apartment in Westchester, PA, and it was really scary. Uh, I had nothing. And so the next day, a client that worked with the company I was at at the time, or no longer at, reached out and offered me a freelance job. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm, you know, I have nothing else going on. And I was able to, I, I remember this, I was like, hey, they offered $20 an hour for uh, product design and graphic design work. And I was like, no, it's got to be 30 because of these reasons. And they're like, okay. And it was the first, I really stood on the value. And that's something where you got to kind of stick up for what you believe in and your value. Especially as a especially as a young entrepreneur, because it's very hard. And I'll never forget the first paycheck I got. I bought this stupid motorcycle with this stupid mustache, <laughs> looking like a Muppet, because um, I had no idea what was going on. I just I wanted to celebrate. I was like, I'm yeah, I'm gonna buy a used motorcycle. Um, and uh, I don't know. It's one of those things to to look back on and, and smile a bit. But that was going. That freelance gig was going pretty well. Uh, but it was only a single client. I was like, okay, wait a second. If I'm going to keep doing this, I'm going to need more clients. Where on earth am I going to like find these other clients? Like I, I don't have any network. I'm brand new. I'm 23. Like what on earth? So I did what anybody would do. I went to Craigslist <laughs> and I went fishing there. And believe it or not, I found uh, two people from SAP. If you're in the Southeast area of Pennsylvania, you know where the headquarters is. They were looking to create a home organization application, and that was their ticket out of SAP. Um, we 
met at a Starbucks on Paoli Pike. We talked for about two hours and we started to engage and I started doing product design from scratch from them. And uh, it was going so well that I actually moved to Philadelphia at the time. And a friend of mine, Ryan Finley, that I met uh, at a client, uh, we shared office space and I brought him into the project to work on it. And it was about 18 months of freelance work. And I was like, holy shit, I think I have my own company now. Like, this is unbelievable. This was always a dream in college to have my own you know, design studio. And I'm 20, now 23 or 24, and I have it. it didn't certainly feel that way. But it was like, I got that thing, but it does not feel like I thought it was going to feel like. And it was about what are the next steps? Well, create a name for your business, register your business in the state you want to operate, and open a business bank account. Uh, you don't need to do an LLC. You don't need to do an S Corp, C Corp, whatever in the beginning. All you need is a, this is a document. This is the one from California. I couldn't find the one from PA. But you need to file a fictitious name. Uh, here you can see thought merchants. Uh, you get that, you take it to the courthouse, get it stamped. I think it's like $35. You take that to the bank and they give you a business checking account. And now you are a sole proprietor. And the big thing here is you have now a business checking account to separate your personal and business expenses. And it makes all the difference in the world uh, when you're starting off. Like accounting stuff gets wild. And I found it out in a hurry. Awesome. You know, I have a share in a studio or sorry, an office in Philadelphia, you know, working on these startup brands in Philly. After the first year, I made over $100,000 my first year of freelancing. And I was like blown away. I was just, it was awesome. More money than I thought I could ever make. And um, yeah, I didn't really follow any, I didn't really pay any estimated taxes. So I got slapped with a $32,000 tax bill the following year. And it was, uh, a crisis, I would say. I had gotten a payment plan. It took two years to kind of dig out of that. And I would say if there's anything, if there's any insight, pay your estimated quarterly taxes. Uh, as a 20th year old, owning your own business, you have no idea how any of this stuff works. And so any you know, mandated planning goes a long way. Now, you're not legally required to in the first year of setting up any sort of organization or sole proprietorship, but man, it sure helps. So I mentioned I moved to Philadelphia. I rented an apartment with this girl. We shared a space. I shared an office. Again, sort of that share economy. Like it gives you, if you can spend less out of your pocket each month, uh, then you have more you know, time and well, more money to experiment, especially as a business owner and you know, fledgling entrepreneur. Um, giving yourself some room to breathe and not having to squeeze every single penny goes along, you know, gives you a a place and a peace of mind to experiment. When I was in Philadelphia, you know, you got to be keen to learn from others, absorb, stay curious, and go to every single tech meetup, startup, product event you possibly can. Whatever's in your domain or your space, go to it. Half of them will be awful. Half of them will be, you know, money, um, but you don't know until you try. And in the beginning, especially as a young kid that has no obligation, go for it. You know, the, what you're able to learn early will set the trajectory of yourself as an entrepreneur. And by golly, if you can talk in front of people, or sorry, if people let you talk in front of them, try. <laughs> um, some work better than others. Bar Camp Philly, uh, I gave my first presentation in front of people uh, there. That's me on the left-hand side, wearing what I thought at the time was a sweet billabong shirt. And uh, that worked out pretty well. I got pretty confident or reasonably confident about my ability to present ideas that I had in my head to others. And then I got invited to go to Bar Camp Philly. That's me on the right-hand side. And uh, yeah, I bombed. It was bad. I was underprepared. Um, it was only 10 minutes. It was awkward. I, yeah, it was embarrassing. But it was the, it's what I needed to buckle down figure out how to prepare the right way for communicating in front of larger audiences because there's all these emotions and adrenaline and stuff that'll affect your performance and you need to get used to that. Uh, you got to get used to exploring the unknown and feeling comfortable. I always say, you know, surf uncertainty. And the more comfortable you get with handling that, uh, the better it will become as an entrepreneur. All right. 
free pizza and beer really did change my life. Uh, we were at the shared office space, a bunch of buddies of mine were going to philly.rb, a Ruby on Rails, which is a programming language uh, meetup. They're like, dude, you should come. I was like, nope, not going with the nerds. They're like, there's free pizza and beer. And I was like, you had me at free, let's go. You know, 24 dude in the city, easy. Well, I met some, uh, it was sponsored by a company, Efficiency 2.0 in New York City that came down to Philadelphia to find new talent to offer them jobs. They're looking for developers. And they were like, are you a developer? And I was like, no, I'm a user experience designer. And they're like, funny, because we're looking to hire one of those too. And I ended up starting to consult with them and taking the Amtrak regional rail train up to New York City and contributing to the startup. And eventually they offered a user experience director job when I was 24 years old. I would say the sooner you can get and learn about equity and options, the better. They're very complicated. There are all sorts of preferred options, different clauses and benefits. And here was the uh, quip from the email that I got in the offer letter. It was like 120K salary plus 0.3% equity. Like a startup in Manhattan. Oh my God. Like, yes, let's do it. Didn't read the fine print or didn't understand the fine print at the time. I had to be employed at the company at the time of an acquisition or liquidation event, which I was not. I missed it by three months. I left three months too early. Um, in the long run, didn't really miss out on too much, but it's one of those things where I didn't have the knowledge. And so I didn't have that information to either negotiate better or anything along those lines. So uh, start learning about equity and options as soon as you can, especially if you're going to get into companies, found companies, or contribute at a, at a very early stage at somebody else's company. Uh, I got really opportunistic when I moved to New York. The, the financial collapse, all the finance bros left Manhattan or downtown Manhattan, the financial district. Um, there was an apartment on 2 Gold Street, believe it or not, this really fancy finance one. Uh, it was $1,600 a month cheaper because they couldn't find anybody because everyone was laid off. And um, yeah, the insight here is like, don't drive a U-Haul truck from Philly trying to save money to New York City. Uh, driving through the Holland Tunnel and in downtown Manhattan is a nightmare. But I was opportunistic and I got a really nice landing place in New York City, in Manhattan, which was amazing. And they put me as the user experience director. Never had senior leadership experience before, but here we go. I got a chance to do a contextual ethnography. It's a type of research where you like embed with the customers that use your products. We had one, uh, a bunch of customers in Chicago. So I got to do that, which was humongous. I actually got paired with an anthropologist from UCLA which was from a career standpoint, unbelievable. But uh, I wanted to leave the company. I had some disagreements. The company three months later got acquired by C3 Energy. The a couple of VPs that'll come back around in this talk, Brian Helmkamp and Noah Davis, they leave and I'm back to consulting. Although I'd never really stopped. I always did stuff on the side because I didn't really have a safety net. And so I needed something else in case the main thing failed. And the insight here is be opportunistic, you know, uh, somebody else's pain can be your gain. It can be tough, especially if you see friends in that industry that get absolutely clobbered. So as an entrepreneur, you got to find where the, where the soft spots are in the economy and go after them. And I'm, I'm grateful because I don't know if I'd ever have the opportunity to move to New York if I didn't get laid off from my job because of the initial downturn and then have the nice terms to rent because renting in New York City is bananas. Um, so I'm just fortunate. I will say this, New York City is amazing in your 20s, personally and professionally have at it. I'm not sharing those photos, but it is a, a formative experience and you will meet other individuals later in your life that have experienced that uh, insanity and you're better for it. And I think it's something not to uh, scoff at. Yep, told you, left efficiency 2.0, went back to consulting and the insight here is exchange. If you have a unique talent and if you're an entrepreneur, you better because you're not going to make it far otherwise um, for money. Like I had a, I did design, I went to art school. I could actually, I could program and create websites and applications. And I had an understanding of how businesses worked. My dad had his own small awning business growing up. And that experience of those three things and me sitting in the middle of it uh, 
was something a lot of people didn't have. And now user experience design became a much more prominent thing as all these products and web applications became bigger. And so I used that unique position to extract money. And that is something as an entrepreneur needs to be like burned into your head and your retina. Becoming a professional. So I start getting confident with some uh, comp consulting with some companies in New York. And now I want to make a name for myself. I want to get, you know, solve challenging problems, work with fancy brands, all that good stuff, right? Sorry, if I look over to my right, it's because I've got another computer up looking for questions in case they pop. But in the beginning, optimize for learning. Uh, when you're trying to become a professional and like really up your game in your mid 20s. Uh, here's an example. This is a meetup at Pivotal Labs in Union Square. I made it a point to go to at least two meetups a week. Uh, New York City makes that easy because of the density and proximity and all the different cultures and passions and industries that intersect there. And uh, I, yeah, every day after work, <laughs> sorry, every other day after work, I was practically at one, just learning and figuring it out. You know, going from different technology ones to business ones to more design focused ones, you know, really spreading the net very wide so I could expose myself to as much as possible. And speaking of that, you really need to surround yourself with people more talented than you. Like if you're the smartest person in the room, find another room immediately, especially if you want to be good. You can always exchange being the smartest person in the room for more money down the road. But in, when in the beginning, becoming an entrepreneur, you want to optimize for learning and de almost de-optimize for income. I mean, here's a couple of examples. This was a workshop I was helping facilitate. Uh, with uh, Pivotal Labs, they do development consulting. I do design and user experience consulting. So it's kind of this symbiotic relationship. We worked on many projects together, but the gentleman leaning in here on the top right underneath this guy's armpit, uh, that's Josh Knowles. He's the director of the New York office and eventually the VP of all European um, offices in for Pivotal. Uh, I learned a lot. He was really scaling and evangelizing agile design and development in New York City at the time. and I got to sit next to him, have beers with him, work on projects together. And that was so helpful in, in my development as an entrepreneur and consultant. Here, I'm working on a project, Dimitri Roche, uh, the gentleman on the left, he now works at Instagram, fantastic software developer, Jonathan Berger in the middle. He's an agilist speaker, generally smart dude, learned tons from him from an agile standpoint. And then the, the gentleman peeking his head in on the right, that's a client of mine at the time was working on a project of his, but Spencer Wang is now the VP of investor relations at Netflix. And so you know, you're kind of getting it from colleagues and clients and you know, you're getting this awesome soup of talent and you're just trying to you know, absorb as, as much as you possibly can. And it doesn't always work. There's a lot of conflicts, but darn it, you're exposing yourself to everything you possibly can. And when getting yourself out there and learning and doing all that jazz, you need to practice your craft. Like, there's people that preach, there's people that practice, you have to do both. And at this point, I started becoming a little bit more established. I got started working with Harry's, the men's razor company. They're based in Manhattan as well. Probably seen them around. I was really fortunate to be working with a small founding group there very early on. On the left-hand side, you can see the wireframes I did uh, for Harry's product index page. On the right-hand side, here's my design. And I'm sure you've seen something like it on their site. And it's really cool to see the impact you can have there. Um, but like, it's not that tidy or that clean or that sexy. Like, this is where we had the meeting talking about how we're going to break that, that work down and distribute among the teams, right? Uh, this is right in, um, I believe, Union Square on the west side. The gentleman in the glasses, that's Jeff Rader, the CEO. And the um, man on the right with the nice hairdo, that's Will Freud, uh, the COO. And, you know, this is where the sausage gets made. We're having conversations. We're documenting things on index cards. We're having, you know, productive negotiations, exchanges, trade-offs. And, you know, during that time, here was another sneak peek. It was somebody's birthday, I think, the day before. It was November. Everyone's looking ridiculous. But, you know, this is, this is where, this is a multi-million dollar evaluated startup. And we're all crowding around this tiny projector, right? Um, and the reason was, is they were trying to, Stay lean. They're trying to see if this works. How do we scale this? We're all figuring it out. Everybody's doing their first, their job for the first time. And I learned a lot and you got to have a lot of empathy at that stage. You can't be too accusatory because 
it won't work and you probably won't even be, they won't let you in the office, right? A really fun thing that stuck with me was they had these Truman razor handles on the table and they have all these little indicators on it. And they were asking surveys, they're all different weights and they're weighted differently, some on the back side, some on the front side. And you would pick and you would, they had a survey form and you would answer which one was your favorite and why. And uh, it's interesting to see, at, especially when you work with these emerging companies, how it really big decisions get made. Sometimes they're unbelievably complicated uh, processes for this, you know, how are we going to do the razor handle? And sometimes they're very casual like this, where they're just taking, you know, an informal survey in the company with the people that work there. And that's really fun to experience. And you get to feel like when you ask the CEO about like, are we sure that this is the right handle? The answer a lot of times is like, I don't know, <laughs> probably not, but we're going to go with it. This is my best one. Speaking of giving back, we did a lot of really good work from an agile design development standpoint, uh, from a you know, process improvement standpoint for delivering web products uh, online so that people could buy and subscribe to shave plans. And they, the Harry's team was really bashful. They were like, oh, I, you know, it's just, it feels like it's barely working and we're all just figuring it out. And I was like, this, you're, you're doing so well here. And I almost had to push the team out in, on the stage and help them with their talk um, because I wanted them to share their experience. And that's how you can not only get more learning because you're going to get, you know, expose yourself, uh, to a larger audience, but then it's a great recruiting tool for the company. Uh, people will come up and, and like, you know, empathize about things that they heard that you were talking about. Uh, but again, I think getting, staying in the community, contributing both ways is critical for being an entrepreneur. Oh man, Casper. Uh, I did three tours of duty over six years. They're the mattress company. I'm certain you've heard of them, but they had very humble beginnings. This is the tech team in uh, lower Manhattan. I think we were doing monthly prioritization at this time. There's Gabe Flatman on the left here, looking on his phone, the CTO, and then Eli with glasses and sort of in the middle there. He was, a, I think, the director of engineering at the time. Um, you know, very humble beginnings, but I was there to, again, working in the product first, optimize the checkout experience and same day courier delivery service. And so if you've if you use Casper seven years ago, you most likely have interacted with the designs that I created for them, which was a, a privilege. It was so much fun because it, at one point there was $700,000 a day going through that, you know, checkout. Then I got into process work with them. And so here, this is quarterly planning with all the important people. We've got Philip Krim in the back, the CEO, uh, Luke Sherwin, the guy looking down next to him. He's a C CCO. There's Michael Kim who does, I, CX, customer experience. Uh, Scott, the tall, tall guy, data analytics, and then Claudina Sarah was doing front end development. You know, again, working with everybody, learning from everybody. And uh, I was helping support Gabe Flatman, the first time CTO. I mean, this was the first Ruby on Rails application he ever built, and it was Casper. And it was, you know, <laughs> hundreds of millions of dollars in valuation and revenue. And so, you, again, you don't know from a you know, complex or sorry, casual, sophisticated, you never know what you're going to enter in, especially when you're consulting and, and trying to build brands and businesses. Hammering it again, participate in your craft. When I was in New York City, I started helping organize Goruko. It's a Ruby on Rails conference. Uh, uh, speakers get up, they talk about, you know, an idea, a technology and implementation, and they share that information with uh, a larger audience. And I helped grow Goruko from 150 attendees to over 350 attendees over five years. And it was just about facilitating, planning, you know, uh, finding the right speakers, get, you know, soliciting proposals. And like, for me, I did a lot of the branding and setup stuff, but it introduced me to all these really cool characters that I would never have ever have gotten to meet uh, otherwise. And there's a lot of those that come back around and help me as an entrepreneur later in my career. Also started organizing after participating in a lot, the New York City Agile UX meetup. It's where user experience practitioners share their war stories, share ideas. And, you know, here is super young me being on a panel and uh, helping facilitate. And again, I was doing this, there was a one meetup a month and it took about two meetings before that to prep every single time. And so it's a lot of, you know, there's work and there's the 20% off uh, on top of that of giving back and contributing.
wanted to make a note here. I did some consulting for Riot Games. They make League of Legends the most popular game in the world at the time. I don't know what it is now. But I got introduced to Santa Monica. They were flying me from New York City to Santa Monica to work on their account experience. And it was a lot of fun, but it introduced me to Southern California. And it's the reason that I'm here. And that's kind of why I had to mention it. I guess I'll help fund a tech company. <laughs> um, this is the only picture I could find of my first desk in New York City. And I'm looking exactly, very curious there. But the CTO of Fish 2.0, Brian Helmkamp, left and started creating this company called Code Climate, which actually helped name. And he was paying me in cash uh, to do product design while he did development. And at one time he actually sold me his Mac computer monitor because he didn't have enough money. And I was like, dude, you should actually give me equity instead of cash. And it worked. And that allowed us to hire more people. And without paying me, because I was only working one day a week with it, with four individuals after a year and a half, we grew to $1.1 million in annual reoccurring revenue with just four people bootstrap without any investor money. And it was this, you know, wild ride where I, I kind of backdoored into helping to found a company. And, you know, it was like, do you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. Sure. And I would never have guessed where it led. You know, we got to the point with 1.1 million bootstrap that we could actually get some seed funding on fantastic terms. And on this uh, image is seared into my brain because, sorry, my dog was getting up. Seared in my brain because uh, we're talking to our lead seed investor at the time, all the conference rooms at the, pardon me, the office we were mooching out of were taken. And we're like, okay, well, we're we gonna take it on the street. Like no way, it's too noisy. And so we went to the service elevator slash trash slash bicycle storeroom at the office and place the uh, trolley cart on top of the trash can and put our laptop there to have the meeting. And, you know, literally that was the beginning of a, being a real company in our heads. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> what? And, you know, we, all right, let's get an office space. Well, we work just started coming out and they had a new place on 28th and Park Avenue. Park Avenue, I never would have thought I had an office or a company I helped found on Park Avenue. And this is it under construction. We had to wait a couple months and then move in uh, and here's us unpacking for the, I think this is like the first or second day we were actually in the office. A lot of fun. The view was sensational, but damn it, Park Avenue was noisy. Yeah, I like to say we did remote before it was cool. Uh, <laughs> when we were growing, we couldn't find New York City talent that uh, was senior enough or what we were looking for really for any reasonable price because those people could get you know, $300,000 at least in like 10% of a company. So we went remote as a strategy. Uh, we didn't want to go remote, but it made total business sense. And we started using hip chat and then Slack came out a couple months later, thankfully. But I was responsible for setting up the asynchronous operations remotely and helping to hire. And because we were able to pull people from all over the United States, we could find a lot more talented individuals that were like, look, I do something really good here in Cincinnati. Um, I'm not coming to New York, but I want to practice my craft. And if we can do it remotely, we both have a match. And it worked awesome. Uh, we went up to nine individuals. We started doing quarterly retreats that I planned. One of them was in Bali, believe it or not. Here's all of us in this longhouse. And it's a really funny story because one of the, uh, an office I didn't show you, but we shared office space with this guy, Colin McCornan, who's the CEO of Customer.io. And we only became friends because we had desks next to each other. Well, his dad is from Bali and they own this little hotel and we were able to get a nice deal and rent out the whole place. And it's like these fostered long-term relationships, uh, you know, le reap these rewards. And it's, it's awesome to see. I mean, there, there's David Calavera of Netlify, Marshall Young of Twilio. There's a bunch of good guys there and girls here. We've got a retreat in San Diego with Jeff Rader, or sorry, Jeff Rafter, who works at GitHub now. Um, but you can see, you know, uh, it's not the risk Carlton for sure. But we eventually got the company more mature. We started getting the branding down, the communication, the product, and started selling. We started buying booths at different conferences. This is the one in San Francisco next to Levi Stadium. Um, you know, we're it's it's actually a thing now. And at this point, uh, I wanted to move to Southern California. And 
make the jump. I remember really clearly talking to my um, girlfriend at the time, now wife, Shannon, about, do you see any like non-million, multi-millionaires that are uh, older than 35 that actually look happy? And I was like, no. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, either we move now or we're going to be in New York City forever. And so we celebrated, we moved to LA. This is a, us celebrating on the plane ride over. And we landed, I went back to consulting. Uh, our place didn't have enough space, but Santa Monica is a very lovely climate all the time. And this is my crank sit stand desk outside with an external monitor and extension cord. And it was misting a little bit in the morning, so I put an umbrella. Um, but this is how I started my consultancy here in Santa Monica, right? I remember going on, well, not Zooms, then it was Google Hangouts. People would look behind me and you see like, you know, there's a mango, there's literally a mango tree behind this on the uh, video. And they'd be like, where are you? And I'm like, outside clearly. And it's one of those things where you can bring joy to other people's, you know, work, work uh, life. And, you know, you can, especially as an entrepreneur, you can kind of go your own way. And that's a lot of fun. The rise and fall of twig toothpicks. So... <laughs> As any responsible adult coming from New York City to California, as soon as I land, I get my California ID, I go to the medical marijuana doctor, I let him know I have crippling anxiety because I run my own business, and I get my medical recommendation to get marijuana. I immediately go to the store, I buy a pre-roll joint, I sit down in my house, I smoke it, I become way too high, like panic too high, and then I go, okay, that's not going to work anymore. <laughs> what do I do next? And it was a traumatic experience, actually. Um, and a lot of people from the East Coast that come here to have the exact same experience. So I do like moderate, you know, responsible dosing of THC. And I started dipping toothpicks in cannabis oil and then sucking on them and then kind of picking my teeth and, you know, working or, you know, going for a walk with my dog and, and my dog, Graham, a golden retriever. He'll make an appearance later. Um, so I started making this. And... Here's the initial brand that I created for it. And you can see they look, they're just dipped in cannabis oil. I think there's some like glycerin, grain alcohol. You can see right here. I got custom toothpicks from Maine, which was really cool. And I started giving them out to friends. They loved it. And then I was like, wait a second, like, let me keep, see if I can make these better. So, because I, there was nobody thought about putting, you know, cannabis inside a toothpick and it having being like a real thing. And there was something very, it was very easy to talk about. And any party I went to, everybody loved them. So as you can see, I'm in my kitchen, living room, dining room slash lab, and, you know, with all the proper protection and gear on, right? Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see me like, you know, getting the bottles ready, literally stirring the oil in and then presenting them for the adoring crowd. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I had no idea what was going on. Like, I'm just trying to, uh, I like cooking. I love science. I was a science fair nerd. So I can figure this out through trial and error. And there are a lot of errors. All right. I got a batch I feel good about. Let's uh, print them out in the home printer. Let's cut them up with an X-Acto knife. Let's get spray adhesive <laughs> and put them on, on the, on the uh, glass jars here. And let's start selling the friends. That starts working. Okay. Let's up, let's up the sophistication level a bit. I start buying a heat plate, magnetic stir. I buy these like little syringes so I can more accurately measure the ingredients that are going in there, right? I'm wearing gloves now. And since this is the 8,000th time I've tried a different batch, I've got a nice glass of rosé to soothe my soul. And I start getting confident around this product. And I, you can see my amazing photo studio at the time. There's my doggy. You know, this is, this is just taping things together. Uh, to get where we need to go and where that destination was was a demo booth at a local dispensary here in venice california the green goddess uh, i got all these things ready i got all these samples ready you know being this advocate for moderate cannabis usage uh, which is totally different you know there's in the, the little pull-up banner there you can see those are the pictures that i took from the kitchen um here's me looking very chipper and ready to talk about toothpicks to anybody you know i went to fedex kinko's to print out this hastily taped up you know, front sign there. Um, but it worked. I started selling reasonable about maybe like 10 vials a week at this one store. It was like, yeah, but recreational was happening. And yeah, uh, 
as soon as recreational hit, you had to have a permit to continue. And I did not have a permit to continue. They were locked for the next two years because the state was worried that nefarious actors would get permits and sell crack to kids or something. I have no idea. It was stupid. So I could no longer sell in any anywhere until I had a permit and those were frozen. I started looking around. There were some brands that had a permit that were willing to kind of loan their permit to you so you could make this stuff legally. Well, that loaning would cost a 25% stake of your, of your organization and 50% of all revenue. So it was kind of dead in the water. And that's where Twig fell on his face, really. And that's where it's been for a while. A couple of weeks later, I was like, man, you know what? I can actually get a patent for this. So I started working with a patent attorney. Uh, here's the artwork in the actual patent, which I'm so glad that I got and kept because <laughs> it's it looks super fancy, right? Uh, the exact reason I applied for a patent and argued in my patent is the exact reason that the patent clerks declined to give me a patent. So after three and a half years and over $21,000 in legal fees and you know patent filing fees, that didn't work either. Whamp. Oop. Right? That's it. We're done. Uh, and that's where it's been. I've got a bunch here at the office, which is lovely, but that's where they are. Tax problem? Yeah, I had a big tax problem. I got this. You owe all this much money. Oh my God, I'm pooping bricks. What on earth is this, right? Well, actually, after a little bit of effort calming down and taking a look at it, um, it was incorrectly filed paperwork from a client of mine at the time. They changed entity and issued me two 1099s to my company. And uh, it took two and a half years to figure out. It's scary. I was like, I'm going to jail. Uh, I worked with a CPA and I was really nice to a clerk there at the IRS. And at the end of the day, and because also I'm a digital office, everything's in Evernote and that makes it easier to find you know, documentation. But after two and a half years, I only ended up owing $3,600. Um, but you will, you know, these things can happen. First, uh, a big break here. I started working with Chainlink. They are now the 12th most valuable blockchain in the world. One of the guys from New York City, Steve Ellis, that I met, and he's in a couple of those pictures, he pulled me in to do the branding. I did the hexagon. Um, you know, that year I took half of my payment in their token and half in cash. And it was an investment. That year I had a, I actually lost money because of that investment. I had to use my business line of credit to really pull me, you know, across the line that year. And it was a big win. I mean, I was getting issued at 11 cents and now it's $36. Uh, I now have a retirement account and house down, down payment money. Thank God, because I had nothing else. I had no other safety net. I was just constantly reinvesting in myself, my business. And if I didn't have that, I, I don't know where I'd be. And now I've been using those funds to reinvest in you know other um, blockchain companies and crypto because now I have a, an innate understanding of how they work, working on them for a while with my design studio personally and, you know, through my business and, you know, hiring my first uh, designer. And I always say it's like, you know, the Mandalorian's like, this is the way. Uh, it's, you just got to continue the business of work. It just continues. It doesn't stop. There's no top of the mountain. You don't know where the top of the mountain is or what mountain even is. And so you just need to rely on your principles that that lens or the, the lens I talked about, you know, there's many thousand aligned decisions uh, and just keep going. And so I came up, here, wrapping up the rules of engagement, uh, some, a couple quips that I've collected over the years that have served me well. Uh, your idea is the cheapest thing you own, right? Like Uber is this humongously private uh, company. They've got, you know, all this valuation. Well, their idea is just a tax service that exists. Why is that not so big? Well, the execution. And so if someone ever says like, I got this great idea, but I have to, you have to sign an NDA for me to tell you. I'm like, no, why would I want that legal paperwork? Your idea is literally the, the most cheap thing you possibly have. And uh, keep that in mind. I can rant on that for like ever. From the book, uh, I think this is an article, the top 10 things art school didn't teach me, if it doesn't exist in a museum or on the internet, it doesn't exist. Uh, you have to put it in the public domain for it to actually exist. There's you know, tons of amazing ideas I have. They've never seen the light of day. And I can think they're really valuable, but until I try them out in the real world, they're worthless. And I, that has served me well to drive, to constantly pushing things online, to the web, in front of people, giving talks, all that kind of stuff. Be authentic. Kind of loaded, but Anthony Bourdain explained it in one of his 
um, episodes, Parts Unknown or something. It's kind of like be yourself, but better. Authentic can mean different things to different people. Um, I think it's, and be true to yourself is kind of like to energy vibe for me. Um, it's like find something that works and do that. Tell the truth all the time. It doesn't always work in the moment, but in the long run, it works out. You don't have to like everyone because darn it, not everyone likes you. Chase what works. You'll find things in your personal professional life that are easy, straightforward. Um, chase that. It's almost like, you know, oh my God, like chasing this rope, like you're fishing, right? Life is messy and nobody is really sure, right? You could evaluate my talk the same way. And uh, you'll see that, that uncertainty as you get older. And the last bit of uh, essential advice, sorry, advice, is take time for yourself. Otherwise, you will go crazy. You've probably seen or read the news about some crazy entrepreneur that is so eccentric and wild. And it's a lot of times because they become obsessed with what they're doing professionally and chasing that. And they're not taking care of themselves. And a big thing for myself and my company, Thought Merchants, is to have this nice work-life balance. Um, when I was in New York City, I've got this really nice professional and personal rhythm. Uh, in New York, I played ice hockey at least three days a week. I did tons of drop-ins uh, for open ice at lunch. And I've traded my skates, and now I surf all the time. And it's the, it's the rhythm that keeps my energy going, my excitement, but also regulates the you know, insanity of the, of the entrepreneurial world because there's always unknown stuff, and you have to surf that uncertainty. I wanted to thank Austin Barto for doing these designs. Uh, he's the illustrator here. He started working here at Thought Merchants in January, I believe, and he's doing really well. And yeah, thanks for listening to me. Take care, be well, and let me know if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to answer more than a few questions. Maybe some things here. Uh, yeah, Steve, one, one question it wants to know if, if uh, sample toothpicks will be distributed. <laughs> no, I mean, you can, if you drive to my studio, I will happily give you some. <laughs> um, we've got some that are CBD uh, only and some that are, are cannabis. The CBD ones are, are legal to sell, but I don't have a storefront or the, anything set up for it. So unfortunately, no, not at this time. That's a good question. I would ask the same thing. Nice graphics. Thank you. Um, yeah. Anything else? Otherwise, that's kind of the, uh, the end of the step. Cool beans, everybody. All right. Well, Steve, thank you very much. And uh, save some toothpicks for me. I'll be coming out to uh, California later this year. <laughs> awesome. I will. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, we will, uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel and, um, um, we're, we're hoping to have, uh, Steve back for another, another talk, um, uh, later in the year. Um, once, uh, you know, once we get into the, into the fall time frame. Um, so really appreciate your time, Steve and, um, uh, enjoy, uh, the Southern California spring summer. I will. All right. Thank you, man. I'll talk to, talk to you soon. Ciao. Thank you for having me. Be well, right. everybody. Thank you.